Let me talk to you about major and minor. <laughs> major. Do a deer, a female deer. Right? Um, also, Frère Jacques, Frère Jacques. Unless, of course, you're Gustav Mahler wanting to have a joke at the French's expense and in the slow movement of your first symphony you decide to put Frère Jacques in minor. Da, 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 Or unless you were my father and decided to sing the farmer in the Dell in minor. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, that's quite timely because that's minor right there. <laughs> in the classical era, um, something you have to understand about 18th century aesthetics, the idea in music was not to um, elicit in people a particular emotion, but to depict it musically. There's a big difference. It's only during the Romantic era that composers are trying to bring out particular feelings in their listeners. It was quite different in the classical era. So for instance, in an opera, there, well not just in an opera, in any piece of music, there were standard forms for ways of depicting an emotion. What I was going to say is in an opera, if you hear an aria that's done with lots of big leaps and it's fairly fast, you can bet your booties that it is a vengeance opera. <laughs> Okay, and that was a standard format. Okay, that one's not me. Um, and so most of the time during the classical era, composers chose, again, because of the, the light of reason, shall we say. This is during the period of the... Enlightenment. Um, <laughs> ah, technology. Gotta love it or hate it. I'm in the latter category most of the time. Anyway, um, most pieces were in major. If you take a look at, for instance, Mozart's um, 20, no. 18 piano sonatas, two are in minor. If you look at his completed quartets of 23, two are in minor. Uh, his symphonies, of 41 symphonies, very few of them are in minor. Uh, the same thing is true in Haydn's case. Not so much with Beethoven. Although only two of his symphonies are in minor, think which ones they are, number five and number nine. And of his string quartets, a lot of the most significant ones, opus 59, number two, um, his two large ones, opus 131 and opus 132, those are in minor. Uh, of his piano sonatas, the Pathétique, the Tempest, the Appassionata, um, those are all in minor. A number of his big piano sonatas are in minor. So he started to, uh, how shall I put it, redress the balance of major and minor. However, having said that about the classical era, the pieces that are in minor tended to be more significant. So for instance, the Lord Nelson Mass or the great mass, that's in C minor. Uh, the Nelson mass is in D minor and then later D major. Um, the first sonata that we are going to sample today is in A major, but the final movement, the one we're actually going to listen to, is in A minor. This is called the Alaturka sonata. It was one of the earliest piano sonatas that Mozart wrote when he was in Vienna. And um, in the final movement, it's called Rondo. And what that means is a piece in which there is a recurring theme uh, 
which is often alternated with um, other material. So you would have A, that's your first theme, and then D, and then A, and then C in rondo, because it goes around in a circle. However, this particular form was one that had a lot, composers treated rather loosely. So for instance, the format for this is not A, B, A, C, A, D. It is A, B, C, D, E, C, A, B, C, and then a coda. So sure, sections recur, but not alternating between A and another section. Um, it's called Rondo a la Turca because it's got a theme that sounds vaguely Turkish. And as I explained in a previous week, there was a, a fad, a madness for Turkish music at this point uh, based on having heard uh, Janissaries. They were these Turkish military bands that had drums and cymbals and a lot of other things and they were really pretty sprightly sounding and so people happened to ignore the fact that the Ottomans were trying to invade the Austro-Hungarian Austro Empire um, <laughs> and instead focused on the music which may have been an interesting way of approaching it. Um, but what I want you to imagine when you hear this is Mozart playing it either on the harpsichord or on the forte piano, both of which have more of a fuzzy sound than a modern piano. And in fact, there was an attachment on the forte piano that allowed for extra buzz. So it was as if there was a cymbal or a snare drum playing along with that. Um, and in fact, Mozart wrote on the autograph copy of the score, cembalo, which meant harpsichord. He then crossed it out and wrote fortepiano. Um, but he didn't cross it out in the, in the later movements. And so we're left wondering whether, in fact, um, uh, he intended it for one or the other. It could work uh, just as easily on, on either one, although you get more dynamic range, of course, on the fortepiano. Uh, the interesting thing about this piece is that four pages of the original manuscript were rediscovered in Budapest in 2014 and were positively identified as going with page five of the original which had been held uh, since Mozart's time. But this was something that had been lost. They were, they were working from other copies and in this original, you can see that Mozart actually made a few changes in the manuscript. So that's a, you know, every few years, something new or newly rediscovered, and particularly if Mozart shows up out of the blue, which is, I think, quite exciting. So in any case, uh, Daniel Barenboim, I'm going to play you the opening of the first movement. It's gorgeous. And I want you to hear it simply because um, it provides a tremendous contrast to the last movement. It's very elegant and clearly in major. So uh, keep your fingers crossed, folks. All right. <laughs> Carefully, this is a much, much younger Daniel Barenboim <laughs> from the one we've been seeing conducting. You may listen to the rest of it at your leisure. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, we are now going to the Rondo a la Turca, and you will hear a very distinct contrast as long as it 
section. Can you hear how harpsichord-like this sounds? Yeah, whoever that was um, stopped it really fast. You can imagine. You can imagine the last note, okay? <laughs> when Mozart wrote a number of his early quartets, he was just getting acquainted with the format of writing for string quartet. You have to understand, it was a very, very new medium. And of course, the pioneer was Franz Josef Haydn. And Mozart knew of Haydn by reputation, but he didn't meet him until later. So he wrote a whole number of quartets in, in, um, in sets. Uh, when he was in Italy, he wrote five or six in two different times. So he wrote about 12 of them when he was in Italy. And then he wrote some other ones later. And then finally, his last grouping, big grouping, um, there was another small grouping later, but his last big grouping, numbers 15 through 19, he dedicated to Haydn. Um, and it's an interesting relationship that they had. Haydn admired his younger colleague immensely. The feeling was mutual, but you have to remember, Mozart was somebody in his 20s trying to prove himself, trying to show that he could right on a par with this great master who had done so much to bring music forward. And so there was a little bit of competitiveness about this. And so he wanted to um, show that it was kind of his way of throwing down the gauntlet and saying, OK, you've, you've created the string quartet in essence. This is my take on what you've done. And so he wrote these five uh, quartets. And in the last one, he does something really quite extraordinary. We often think of Mozart, how shall I put this, uh, living very comfortably within classical forms. And it's true that he did, so that he wasn't, um, he wasn't somebody who was always breaking these vessels the way Beethoven did later. But that does not mean that he didn't stretch things almost to the breaking point or experiment. 
His, it's just that he was so smooth in what he did that it's easy to miss his experimentation. It's impossible to miss Beethoven's experimentation. It's right there in your face. But with Mozart, it's all so elegant and it seems so very effortless, effortless that we forget that he was making experiments in format. So for instance, the way he treated the rondo was very flexible. The way he treated melodies, um, often his phrase lengths, they all sound symmetrical. They all sound wonderfully even. And yet you'll find a phrase that is 16 bars long and another one that's 14 and another one that's 22. But you don't notice that because they, um, they have such a wonderful integrity that we just accept them the way they are. So this is all a rather long introduction into the beginning of the final of the Haydn Quartets in C major, which uh, got a nickname very soon after it was published. It was called the Dissonance Quartet. And the reason for that is not because it sounds like Schoenberg, but because in the mid-1780s, it did sound very striking. And you'll notice it because what happens is the cello opens up with these throbbing Cs. But against it, each of the other instruments comes in with notes that make a chord that doesn't quite resolve. But then when it resolves, it doesn't resolve the way you think it will. And so it keeps doing this, and it promotes a tremendous feeling of unease until finally the piece resolves into this wonderful allegro, which is in a very sunny C major. So he pushes and pushes and pushes and then says, OK, now we'll have some fun. And so the opening is an adagio, and it's really very striking. So we're going to listen to the first movement. And this is played by uh, the wonderful Emerson String Quartet. This was, play this was done, I think, in, uh, in Japan. Um, uh, stop, 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 David. Um, back in the early 1990s. Anyway, here's the opening. So an A flat comes in, and then a B. change. 
is now the development section in a Sonata Allegro form. this development section is in minor. Okay, so he's not just changing the, the material, he's also changing the mode. But now we're back. This is the recapitulation. And one of the things that you may not be aware of about the Emerson String Quartet is that um, they were, at least in the modern era, the first quartet to alternate who was playing first violin. So depending on what the piece was, one or the other of the two violinists played first. Yes? Are these musicians still playing? You know? The Emersons are still playing. David Finkel, the cellist, left uh, two, maybe three years ago. He's the he and his wife, Wu Han, who was actually at the Hart School of Music at the same time I was, um, and they met there. Um, they are the uh, co 
uh, artistic directors of the Chamber Music Society of Lincoln Center. So I think touring with the quartet after a while got in the way. So he has, he retired from the quartet, but somebody else has taken his place and they're still, yes, they're still going strong. So, yes. Well, then you're in for a wonderful surprise. <laughs> um, late in, relatively late in Mozart's life, when he was about 30 or so, he met a clarinetist named Anton Stadler. And Stadler was such a fine player that Mozart decided he was going to write music for him. And so it was for Stadler that he wrote the trio we're about to hear and two of his most wonderful late works, his clarinet quintet, um, which, by the way, is the first major effort in that form. There have been some fine clarinet quintets since then, most notably by Brahms. Um, but, and some guy named Nielsen wrote one also. <laughs> but anyway, um, that and also his clarinet concerto. Th these three large pieces were written for, uh, particularly for Anton Stadler, and also um, it, um, how shall I put this, uh, kindled or at least rekindled a love of the instrument in Mozart so that in two of his final three symphonies he uses clarinets, which had not been the case before. In one case he actually substitutes clarinets for oboes, and in another case he uses them along with oboes. Um, and in his Requiem he uses an antique version uh, sort of a lower version, like what we would see now as a, an alto clarinet, uh, the basset horn. So the piece we're about to hear, which acquired later the uh, nickname Kegelstadt, which means someplace where you go bowling. And that's because Mozart wrote that he wrote this piece after he went bowling. Now, Mozart was a fun-loving guy. He loved to play billiards, he loved to go bowling, he played cards. Um, and it, it all became stimulus for him. Um, and he wrote this um, as well for a student of his. Um, a, he became friends with a family uh, called the von... Hmm. I'm going to pronounce this in German because it's got a V-O-N in front of it. Von Jakwin, or I should say von is that right? Yeah, von Jacquin. If it were in French, it would be Jacquin. It's J-A-C-Q-I-N. And he was friends with the whole family. And so the premiere of this work happened as a house concert at their house with Stadler playing clarinet, Mozart playing the viola part, and his student, um, Franziska von Jacquin, or <laughs> Jacquin, um, on piano. And uh, it's a wonderful three-movement work, an Andante, a Minuet, and a Rondo Allegretto. And we're going to hear the, the first movement. Wait a second. Sorry, I'm trying to get us back all the way. This one cuts in really quickly. There we go. <laughs> 
not a lovely ending. It just yes. disappears. Um, two, two things of note here. One, um, this piece and also the clarinet quintet and possibly the clarinet concerto were all written for the basset clarinet, which is, is kind of midway between the basset horn, which is a, a lower clarinet, like an alto clarinet, and the modern clarinet. Um, this one, of course, is being played on a standard. I, th I think this is a B-flat clarinet because it's in a flat key. And that's the second thing I wanted to point out, is that this is a piece in E-flat major. And that key apparently connoted, for Mozart, close friendship. And so writing it for this family, with whom he felt a particular bond, this was a natural key for him to put it in, no pun intended. I did say that when Mozart wrote pieces in minor, they tended to be quite significant. The next piece we're going to hear is his G minor string quintet. Um, and, and I also want to say that this was the first piece written for this combination of uh, clarinet, viola, and piano. Some 19th century composers did later, but Mozart's the first to do this. Um, string quintet in those days just meant string quartet and adding another viola. My own preference, and most composers who write string quartet, string quintets rather, um, write two viola parts. It took Schubert to write what I think is the right combination, which is two cellos. Uh, he did. Well, he wrote so many string quintets, I'm not surprised. <laughs> um, so this one is in G minor. And the curious thing about it is that it has about it a, a, a movement, a, a, a feeling, an overall feeling of such deep pathos that it, it's remarkable in several ways. The th one way in which it's remarkable is that this feeling continues into the slow movement, which is the third movement, even though that movement is in major. In fact, this movement inspired Tchaikovsky to write that it gave the very personification of the deepest uh, feeling of sadness that he could imagine, of sorrow. Um, the other curious thing is that the last movement, which is in major, is a complete mood change. It's a very sunny and upbeat final movement. And that has puzzled some people. Um, but again, in the age of enlightenment, it's not that unusual to have something suddenly launch into major at the end um, as, a, as a way of writing the ship, as it were. Uh, so. What we are going to do is listen to the third movement. And for me, the sound of the, the main theme, its spaciousness and the length of the melody and its gravitas actually reminds me very much, more than most of Mozart's work, of later Beethoven, actually, who would write these grand movements that had so much spaciousness in them. Mozart's slow movements tend to be a little bit different. This one, though, has that feel about it. So this is the, um, this is a televised performance in black and white from London in 1966 with the uh, Amadeus Quartet. And um, who's the other violist? Um, and Cecil Aronowitz. So here is the third movement.
Notice how the second viola is adding commentary in this minor section. <laughs> 
thing I do want to point out, you may have noticed, and it's not just because of the camera work, um, in both this piece and in the quartet, um, how much Mozart relies on the first violin to carry a great deal of the material. Uh, this is something he inherited from Haydn, and you have to remember, again, that these are very new forms. It's not until we get to Beethoven that the string quartet really gets liberated so that the parts become more equal. And this is not an early work of Mozart's. This is K516, so it was written 1787. So this is four years before his death. Um, it, don't get me wrong, this is not a piece like an early string trio or quartet of Haydn in which it's almost all first violin and very, very accompanimental in the other instruments. But it's still not quite equivalent in the way you see in 19th century composers. Um, the last piece that we're going to hear, the quintet for clarinet and strings, is one of the greatest works of chamber music ever written. Um, and like the clarinet concerto, which was written right around the same time, they're both in the key of A major. A um, couple of things I would point out to you. Um, it's in four movements uh, with an allegro and then a Larghetto, which is absolutely exquisite and magnificent in its simplicity. Um, and then a minuet and trio. And then a theme and variations for the last movement. And I would just like to point out that in the final movement, um, that the mood darkens in the third variation with a viola solo, which comes out of nowhere. It doesn't sound like any of the other variations. But then he brings it back into major for the last two variations in the coda. It's, a, it's just a wonderful, extremely Mozartian touch. Um, we're going to hear it from a, 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 record, uh, a live performance um, with a group that I think was put together. And the only people I know in this group are Pamela Frank playing the first violin and a much younger Yo-Yo Ma playing cello. So we're going to hear the whole thing. And because... I'm, I'm, this is my excuse. Because the internet was so fractious when we started, we're going to run a, a couple minutes late. But you won't mind, I know, when you hear this. 
Notice how he's reversed in the, in the development. He's reversed who has the opening melody and who has the answer. It's the clarinet that opened this time and the first violin answered. Now both the clarinet and the first violin are playing that melody together this time. Mozart plays in that movement much more freely with the instruments. So there's canonic movement where first violin plays and the second violin, then the viola, then the cello. So there's a lot. This is a, a big step forward in terms of the independence of the parts. And now he makes everything much simpler. <laughs> No, no, they just are always adjusting their reeds, clarinetists. <laughs> <laughs> 
string players don't have to deal with condensation. As a former trombonist, I know the truth of this. This is the first variation. <laughs> 
I was right, right? It's a wonderful, wonderful piece. Yes. Who, was the clar yes. Who was the clarinetist? Was that, uh, the clarinetist was uh, Seiji Yokokawa. Do you know where this took place? I believe in Tokyo, but I'm not positive. Okay. Um, although the script looks Korean to me for the little bit that I know about it. Um, <laughs> They sure had a good time playing it too. Yeah. He always enjoys it. Next next week, Don Giovanni.